Welcome to uh, this very special webinar on RESET, and we'll explain in a minute what RESET is, intended as a tool to help accelerate tobacco harm reduction as a complementary measure to tobacco control. And we are extremely privileged to have with us today Professor Heiner Sturber, who we'll introduce in a minute, and Dr. Derek Jach, a very well-known global health advocate, and as most of us know in the tobacco uh, control field, one of the architects of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Just a quick word on the genesis of this webinar. At the moment in the world, there are still 1.1 billion consumers of combustible tobacco, of cigarettes. And we know that one out of every two of those consumers will die a premature death due to tobacco-related disease. So over the last decade and a half, there has been, there has been some concerted uh, efforts to also use tobacco harm reduction strategies to complement tobacco control to help control the tobacco epidemic. Now, in the past, WHO has used, and currently, WHO has used primarily two instruments for tobacco control. One is the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And uh, the second is a tool that has been used to accelerate the implementation of tobacco control, which is called the MPOWER. Now, MPOWER was conceived to help prioritize certain elements of the convention so as to accelerate its adoption in member state regulation. And MPOWER was simply a list of priorities of which M stands for the monitoring of tobacco use, P, the protection of people from tobacco smoke, O, the offer to help people to quit tobacco use, the W is to warn about the dangers of tobacco, the E is the enforcement of, on bans on uh, tobacco advertising and promotion, and R was to raise taxes uh, on tobacco products to make it as unattractive and unacceptable as possible to consumers. So that was the intent with Empower. Now, over the years, the tobacco harm reduction community has become increasingly frustrated because although in Article 1D of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, there is a very clear reference to the use of tobacco harm reduction strategies to complement tobacco control, uh, we all know that this has not in practice been uh, recognized by most member states or WHO for that matter, and therefore the genesis of RESET, which is a set of measures to help accelerate the adoption of tobacco harm reduction policies, science, and ultimately regulation. And Professor Heinrich Sturver from the University of Frankfurt for Applied Sciences has embarked on a journey to make RESET real and apply this science-based effort in as many settings as possible, but starting in Germany and the EU. So we are extremely um, privileged on this day, and I perhaps just end my introduction with this day, which is the 31st of May, 2022, which is what WHO and the UN system has designated as the World No Tobacco Day. So there can't be a better day to uh, reflect on reset and ways to accelerate tobacco control and tobacco harm reduction. On that note, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Jessica Perkins. Hello everyone, my name is Jessica, as Dilon said, and it's my pleasure to be with you here today on this webinar, discussing such an important topic for tobacco harm reduction. Today, I represent an organization called Health Diplomats and a platform called tobaccoharmreduction.net. Health Diplomats is a global public health consultancy that specializes in saving lives across the world using harm reduction tools in tobacco, alcohol, food, and drugs. Tobaccoharmreduction.net is a platform where we share news and resources about tobacco harm reduction globally. A bit about my background, so I'm a chemist by training and have experience in science and R&D, product development of alternative nicotine products and business development. It is now my pleasure to introduce our panel of speakers today. So firstly, we have Professor Heino Sturver. Heino Sturver is a social scientist and specializes in social scientific addiction research at the Frankfurt University of Applied Sciences in Germany. 
Professor Sturber, can you please tell us about your professional background in more detail, the work of the unit at the university, and specifically the work that you have done in the field of tobacco harm reduction? Mm -hmm. Many thanks for the introduction, Jessica. Um, I'm a professor at the uh, Faculty of uh, Health and Social Work, and uh, especially the uh, tobacco-related problems are of uh, great uh, importance uh, for my students to read my whole research. And so far, um, it's, uh, let's say, a very urgent uh, and a very important uh, um, topic uh, to look for other um, uh, goals uh, that we can offer to um, um, that we can offer to um, smokers. And uh, definitely the, the ultimate um, step, quit or die, or die earlier, uh, cannot be the only uh, solution. So we need uh, some interim goals uh, setting out and offering thus um, more detailed uh, goals to those who are, uh, who tend to quit smoking, those who are, let's say, on the run, on the way to stop. As we know, um, the um, smoking um, is a very uh, a dynamic and a very uh, severe addiction comparable to heroin addiction or um, other um, forms of drugs. And I think the whole debate around, uh, let's say, strategies to quit smoking, they are uh, lacking uh, an understanding, a deep understanding of the phenomenon uh, of addiction. So once we have that, uh, we can more easily, um, let's say, uh, look for um, alternatives uh, and uh, for, for instruments or for methods that um, similarize, uh, let's say, smoking and on an haptical way, on an oral way, on an uh, um, olfactorical way and, and, and such, let's say, um, the new products of uh, nicotine delivery. Um, they have quite an importance, and my plea is to diversify um, the uh, harm the, the um, quit smoking strategies and using and utilizing harm reduction strategies. Thank you very much for those um, extremely valid points, Heino. Um, next, we have Dr. Derek Yach. So, Dr. Yach is a global public health consultant and has focused his career on advancing global health. Derek, can you please tell us more about your work? the FCTC, and also your recollection of World No Tobacco Day historically. Thanks, Jessica, and uh, great to join you all, uh, particularly on World No Tobacco Day. Let me start with that. Um, many people may not be aware that World No Tobacco Day was first celebrated actually on April 7th, 1988. It was World Health Day. Uh, it eventually got moved by resolution of the WHO to May 31. Uh, to have its own separate day. Um, I was uh, in South Africa where I was working extensively on tobacco control at the time. And um, we had arranged for a special uh, edition of the South African Medical Journal to focus entirely on smoking. And the context was important. First of all, um, South Africa was home to one of the uh, most important independent tobacco companies at the time, the Rembrandt Tobacco Company later bought out by BAT. Um, and they asserted a lot of very powerful pressure on people not doing the kind of research that we were doing. Uh, secondly, South Africa was not a member of the World Health Organization. Uh, we were, were banned at the time uh, because of apartheid. Um, and a number of us felt that despite that, we wanted to show solidarity with what was going to be a very important day uh, going forward. And unusually, managed to get the medical journal to have this review, which outlined the best global practices, uh, what are the, some of the legislative needs, uh, the fact that um, South Africans of all races would in time suffer the consequences, particularly as urbanization happened. And the president of the Medical Research Council at the time, a noted cardiologist, uh, Dr. Andres Brunk, uh, wrote, I think, a very powerful editorial and again, at a time when he knew that the tobacco industry, many of them his friends, would not be particularly happy with what he put in. Um, most importantly, we learned from that day that the success of World No Tobacco Days then and going forward really are whether you reach out to the smoker and you show empathy, support, 
guidance um, initially to quit, and now we know that to quit and to switch to tobacco harm reduction options will save their lives, the lives and the people around them, their family and friends were encouraged to take part. Over the years when I, I left um, South Africa and went to the World Health Organization and spent many years to, um, on the Framework Convention, um, every year uh, we would try and use the World No Tobacco Day specifically to start off by reaching out to the smoker to have the health professional bodies, particularly the doctors, the nurses, the dentists, join hands with us to on that day, because we know that on most other days, they didn't give counseling to their smokers, at least for one day to provide them with that support. And the results were rather spectacular. When you evaluated the impact of the programs, first of all, the media in every country, at the local level, at the town level, at very small community level, loved the story. They loved something to talk about where they could engage people in their community. Ask smokers, why were they struggling? What were their issues? Talk to local policymakers, how they were going to make it easier. Sp speak to the local doctor, the nurse, the dentist, see what they were doing. And overall, it galvanized a movement to try and end smoking. Sadly, over the years, I've seen the day being used for theoretical policy discourses around all sorts of things, usually about how terrible the tobacco industry is, which frankly doesn't lead smokers to put down their cigarettes, try alternatives, make sure that they can start on a life of being smoke-free, which is what the original intent is. So I'm really thrilled um, that we have this chance to speak directly to smokers worldwide, the health professionals worldwide, and say, let's actually get it right this time. The, what is different now from when we started was that we didn't have the extraordinary breadth of alternatives that we now have and I'm sure we'll be talking about over the next few minutes. Thank you very much Derek for putting some historical context around of No Tobacco Day um, and then I'll move on to finally Dr. Delon Human. So Dr. Human is a physician and global public health advocate who advocates tirelessly for tobacco harm reduction. Delon, can you please tell us more about your professional career and also the work that you have personally done in the space of tobacco harm reduction. Thank you, Jessica. Um, well, first and foremost, I am a physician who counseled thousands of patients in uh, tobacco and specifically encouraging them uh, to, to quit smoking. I have to say at the beginning of my career, very unsuccessfully, because I was still one of the quit or die brigade of health professionals. And only when I saw the, the data in Sweden where the Swedes had used Swedish snus to get and help smokers to, to switch to less harmful products that I realized the importance to save lives um, of tobacco harm reduction. So physician firstly, and then I was the secretary general of the World Medical Association, which is essentially the, the global organization of all physician organizations, which was a tremendous privilege to meet physicians from all over the world and engage with them in helping to increase professionalism, ethics, and research in, in our uh, wonderful profession. And then I also had a stint as the Secretary General of the International Food and Beverage Alliance, which in essence was the big food and beverage companies also diversifying and changing their product portfolios to make their products less harmful. So to move away from snacks and soda only to, to more healthy offerings to consumers. Um, during this time, I've had the privilege to work with Derek as a colleague over many years, and I can remember World No Tobacco Day in 1999, Derek, when Derek asked me, he was working uh, for WHO, and I was the, the World Medical Association um, the Secretary General, and he asked us to convene a campaign of all the NGOs and health professional associations on that day. And the theme of that particular World No Tobacco Day was all tobacco kills don't be duped. And if I think back, that's probably an imprecise theme. It was very well intentioned, like all of our work. Uh, but in fact, the nicotine, which is derived from tobacco products or tobacco plants um, as one particular source, is also used the nicotine replacement therapy, which is used in smoking cessation. So that's really the importance of the webinar today, is just to highlight the 
opportunity to differentiate between the combustible forms of tobacco and nicotine and the non-combustible forms of tobacco and nicotine. And we know that it's the combustion that kills, it's not the nicotine. And for this, um, I am particularly respectful of the impact that Professor Sturve has already made in Germany, the EU and beyond with the exceptional work that he has done at the University of Frankfurt on firstly convening um, uh, summits on harm reduction in drug related, alcohol related, but specifically tobacco related harm reduction. He's been a fantastic communicator. He's published now four books on tobacco harm reduction in German, which has now been translated into many languages. And he's made a major impact on policy, science, and even the, the consumer perceptions in Germany. So I tip my hat to, to Professor Sturve and look forward to what he, what he has to say about this reset. And then uh, for, for Derek, the, the work that he has done tirelessly in different parts of the private and public sectors, mostly in his life in the public sector where he's always made an impact in helping to prevent and control, especially non-communicable disease and the premature death because of that. So on that note, perhaps we can just uh, swing Jessica to the, the topic of our webinar, which is a reset. And perhaps I could just ask Professor Sturver if we could go uh, through the different acronyms within reset to explain what it is. So just this background, uh, Professor Sturver, particularly in his role in the Frankfurt University, where applying the science is the dictum. Uh, reset is a way in which tobacco harm reduction can be accelerated, both in science activities, but ultimately its impact on policy. So if I could just perhaps share my, my screen so that we can have as background the, the acronym. <clears throat> I know it, can, yeah. you, can, can you see the slide? Yes, I can so see on that. Perhaps, I know if I could ask you to tell us about some of the components of RESET yeah. and your thinking behind that, please. Yeah, RESET is meant um, as an advocacy program, as an advocacy program uh, for uh, preferred regulatory principles to maximize the harm reduction potential of vaping products uh, while addressing public misconceptions and minimizing the risk associated with the, uh, with the gate um, category. So that's what um, Dylan already mentioned. Um, it should be, let's say, like empower and, and, and uh, advocacy campaign and advocacy instrument, which is uh, ready for, let's say, uh, um, safeguard these surrounding um, issues uh, around uh, harm reduction. So first of all, R is standing for risk-based um, regulation. So of course we need a regulation that is uh, um, aware of the risk and uh, that is differentiating between the risk of products, of course. So, um, and that is, let's say, to be done in, for, in the form of uh, labeling, uh, in the form of uh, um, uh, packaging and, and, and promotion. In all these fields, let's say, um, a risk-based regulation is necessary and uh, to be ensured. So E is for standing for ensuring uh, intended use. Um, that means, of course, um, that we have to prevent youth uh, to access uh, um, tobacco and vaping products. Um, that is a global uh, um, goal, definitely, um, to, let's say, get them away, to not, uh, let's say, um, um, fulfill the gateway hypothesis, um, which is uh, very much debated. Fortunately, there is no gateway, uh, at least uh, scientific data do not let's say, uh, validate that, um, and that should be kept in mind. However, it is very uh, necessary to protect, uh, protect the youth uh, from starting. And also safety issues uh, is, um, of course, uh, something uh, which uh, is of utmost importance that the consumer uh, are aware and uh, are, 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 it is safeguarded that there is no additional safety lack um, uh, they have to, to face. 
Finally, uh, the air safety and quality. Um, here we see that we need uh, regulations or regulations existing should uh, contain uh, uh, paragraphs for the ingredients um, for product standards, should fulfill product standards um, and um, testing and conformity with chemical and uh, uh, electronic um, regulations is very necessary. Today I had a, an interview on the radio station because of the uh, word uh, no smoker day. And um, again, I was asked what are the ingredients of uh, let's say um, um, electronic nicotine um, systems. And uh, I had to say, of course, we all know these ingredients already because we are confronted with them in many ways um, that uh, in our, uh, let's say, daily life about products, uh, they are controlled, um, they are tested, and so far, uh, all the consumer uh, um, buying uh, products uh, with flavors and need to be aware that these flavors are to the best uh, quality um, that we can think of in a nourisher nourish, um, chemical industry. So E is standing for environmental um, considerations. Again, um, life cycle of ends uh, need to be regulated. The environmental impact needs to be kept in mind once we speak about uh, electronic uh, nicotine uh, devices. Uh, and also uh, it needs to be um, aligning with uh, the um, ESG standards. Um, that is for sure something very, very important. Finally, the T, traceability and uh, fiscal policies. Um, in Germany, we just recently, uh, we made the mistake, or politicians made the mistake to put the same taxes on uh, electronic nicotine delivery systems than on combustible cigarettes. So there's no, let's say, um, no, um, not an incentive uh, for smokers um, to quit um, to other um, products, uh, to less uh, harmful products. So if it's the same price, uh, then that at least the monetary um, incentive is uh, getting away. So uh, that is uh, something we need to keep in mind, that regulations uh, need to ensure product uh, authenticity authentic um, and uh, throughout the supply chain, that's very important, and uh, to rise uh, the um, proportionate uh, fiscal policies is also something uh, we have to go for. And so far, this is the concept, this is the frame of reset, and um, we should be uh, very much aware that each of the letters uh, is um, a full-blown strategy in a way. So we should go for this and that. And uh, I think the reset is a perfect frame we can utilize uh, um, for, um, for our um, um, advocacy campaigns. Thank you very much, Aina. Maybe if I can turn to Derek and just uh, also to set the context and the history. Uh, Derek, what would your view be on the efficacy of Empower as an accelerator of tobacco control as we now look at reset as a potential accelerator of tobacco harm reduction? What are your views on Empower? Thanks, Dylan. Well, I think we've got to remember that um, Empower was um, introduced by Bloomberg Philanthropies, not by WHO initially. Um, as a means to try and codify and take the framework convention and simplify it down to a number of elements. And they came up with six. Um, and there lies the first problem. The oversimplification misses the need for an integrated approach. It totally ignores one of the most crucial things in tobacco control, funding it. All the financial provisions of the framework convention were scrapped. Um, secondly, it ignores completely the research and development components, which have yet to be activated by WHO. Thirdly, it ignores the success that will come and how it's going to impact on farmers. Um, and finally, and most crucially, the elements that are in um, are not really able to be evaluated in terms of impact. They list mainly activities. So for example, when you read the reports, you'll talk about how many people are covered by law Y, X, Y, and Z. I have no idea what it means to be covered by a law. The question is, is it implemented, yes or no? Yes. Exactly. Um, and most of the important provisions, particularly two, taxation and cessation, 
by their own records are way below where they should be in the sort of 20% mark by countries. So I would say overall, um, the crude effort to simplify was not a good idea. Second of all, they haven't put the energy behind ensuring the measures have impact. And for that, they need to think about how you adapt the lofty provisions of words that have been developed in Geneva, ideally for a country with a very sophisticated legal enforcement capacity and apply that into the complex developing countries of India, Pakistan, Nigeria, Kenya, where the regulatory capacity is much weaker. Um, so I would, I would say that um, it's not surprising that we still have over a billion smokers in the world um, when you look at the non-specificity and vagueness of empower. Thank I you, Derek. Yeah. Yes, please, please. So let me, let me comment um, on, on the reset idea, which I think is um, a good counterweight to these start a discussion. And maybe just um, four comments. I do think one needs to think about the issue of disinformation and misinformation um, as it's mentioned, not as a footnote, but it needs to be an active part of the program. Um, the level of disinformation, and I use the word disinformation, as being information deliberately designed to confuse the public and confuse consumers. Um, and we know that when it comes to just one measure, what percentage of people, doctors and the public believe that nicotine is the primary cause of cancer caused by cigarettes? The figures um, as um, determined by surveys over the last three, four years by the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World have shown a worsening of the percentage of people who believe that nicotine is the primary cause of cancer. Um, other studies that have come out among doctors in India and doctors in America show that close to 60, 70% of doctors believe that nicotine is the primary cause of cancer caused by cigarettes. All of this is profoundly wrong. And I think if reset is going to have impact, you have to reset the basis of knowledge particularly starting with doctors, dentists, and nurses. Some other elements I think are important. When I think about risk-based um, proportionate regulation, I think about the successes we've seen in the, um, the world of other uh, dirty legacy industries, the way governments act to make it easier for the desired new products to be used by consumers. So if you want them to buy um, switch to solar, you make that cheaper, you make it more effective, you have the regulatory environment in its favor. If you want people to move out of the internal combustion engine, you make the manufacturer's ability to actually produce electric cars easier, and you make it easier for consumers to have access to places to plug their cars in. And so you could go on. The history of creating a mixture between the regulatory approach and an incentive to industry to move in that direction and one that the consumer demands is kind of common. And I think what, what you're talking about here is exactly what we need. Clearly there needs to be a good differentiation by many categories between a combustible cigarette and a toxic smokeless cigarette and the reduced risk products, the full range, e-cigarettes, heated, to, heated tobacco products, snus and nicotine pouches. And the elements, some of them are um, under risk proportionate, and I see some are under traceability. Number one is tax and price. Clearly, there has to be a price incentive, or at least a price neutral solution for people to move from a combustible cigarette to these products. And that can be achieved in many ways by the manufacturer through the excise tax policy and so on. Second, there needs to be a communication differential. Clearly, the message of uh, cigarettes kill doesn't apply to an e-cigarette or to snus. In fact, if you're using snus and you're sitting in parts of India with a toxic smokeless product, your life will be saved from oral cancer. Uh, very different messaging is needed. Thirdly, um, we need to look at flavors. Flavors um, clearly are used by many smokers as a means of getting out of their combustible tobacco cigarette. They want to get away from the tobacco flavor and they're looking as adults for something different, whether it's menthol or whatever it is. The differentiation on the basis of flavors is therefore also a crucial element. And the last one I'd say, which hopefully will not be happening 
too soon, but eventually we'll get there, is going to be differentiation in terms of the level of nicotine. And while the long-term discourse on lowering nicotine in combustible cigarettes is just warming up, that cannot happen unless there are uh, levels of nicotine to allow the current smoker to move on to a nicotine level that would be suitable for them that is no longer toxic. Um, I think the safety point is, is taken very strongly. And I think it is amazing that we don't actually have um, acknowledged safety standards. I think if this effort is able to galvanize the major regulatory bodies to define these, I think the countries that are looking at how you regulate and are starting to, um, all the way from China to the US, to the UK, to New Zealand, to Guatemala, I think you'd be doing them a great service. And um, I think uh, hopefully in time, WHO would also weigh in. I think ultimately, uh, one of the issues under safety will also be the source of nicotine itself. And I can see the day coming when we will no longer tolerate the use of tobacco derived nicotine in favor of synthetic nicotine, knowing that you can reduce and remove the contaminants far easier by not starting with them in the first place. And then finally on traceability, I was really pleased to see that as an element. And um, I think, you know, I think we'll, we'll learn what more of what's about. But if we had traceability elements in place during the so-called Iwali pandemic of 2019, we would have known pretty rapidly it had nothing to do with these cigarettes and was entirely due to contamin contaminated THC cartridges. Um, and again, saying where do they come from requires traceability. So I think this is a very good um, discussion uh, area, not just for discussion, but I think it provides a tool to talk to regulators and to inform the public about so that they can see this truly could help them address um, how they actually get out of smoking. Thank you for those insightful comments, uh, Derek. Before we turn to uh, Professor Sturber, Jessica, I think you had a, a point on uh, funding. Yeah, so I think Derek already mentioned funding, but we had something more specific. So in terms of the financing of the reset framework, what role do you think industry or governments can play in this? Well, I think what is very interesting to, to, to consider is how um, when you work out how you actually implement public health programs, um, usually you think immediately about how much does government need at the local level, at the state level, at the national level, international level, and you do your sums and do it. What makes tobacco harm reduction a real win for the governments at every level is that the major costs are borne by the manufacturers and the private sector. The cost of innovation have already been borne, billions of dollars by companies around the world. Uh, the costs of uh, testing different products, of getting them out, going through the complex regulatory regime. And then most importantly, once they're in the market, who bears the cost of distribution and the supply chain and getting it into the hands of consumers, which is in the end, what really matters. You want to make sure that every single smoker, every single user of smokeless tobacco products, which are toxic, has the opportunity to get a product that's safe and that is affordable. That's what the private sector does particularly well. So the full costs are no longer carried by the government, but are carried by the private sector, a big saving to the private budget, which allows them to use minimal amount to do what they do best, oversee whether there are any untoward effects ensuring that there's a reasonable regulatory regime and ensuring that the tax structure that works the way it does. Eric, thank you for that. And, and uh, I know uh, Professor Stover, we'd like to just tap into your experience in Germany. So you in your unit and at the university, you try and apply sciences to the real world of policy and science in Germany and particularly during the deliberations of the European Union and its Tobacco Product Directive, you've been very active to highlight and focus some of the areas that need to be fixed in the Tobacco Product Directive, but then also for the German government to consider these when, as they are busy developing regulations for, for instance, uh, electronic nicotine delivery systems or e-cigarettes. Uh, in what way do you think can reset, accelerate the establishment of risk proportionate regulations for e-cigarettes in Germany and beyond? 
Thank you very much, Dylan. Um, I think that the reset frame uh, is um, a, a fantastic start, let's say, to go into negotiations, uh, to go into, let's say, public discussions about uh, the ways, uh, the strategies uh, of how better control, um, let's say, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, ends, uh, electronic nicotine uh, delivery systems. Um, it's a good basis to talk on each of the um, sub points um, I just mentioned um, in order to, to get it to come into negotiations with the, with the government. And I think um, we are on a good way after the new uh, government has been installed. Uh, and the, the new um, drug commissioner is much more, uh, let's say, open to uh, open for harm reduction. He, it's even mentioned in the coalition uh, treaty um, that um, the uh, coalition or the, the new government is uh, more strongly uh, pushing harm reduction. Um, they, of course, meant harm reduction um, in the field of uh, illicit drug use. Um, that's something I worked on for the last um, 20, 25 years. And we came to a certain success in avoiding additional risks, uh, consumers or uh, people with uh, um, substance use disorders do not want to have, like um, giving out uh, steroids, needles and syringes uh, to uh, injecting uh, opiate users, um, guaranteeing it in every, let's say, setting where they are, also in prisons and many other things. So this, of course, it was avoiding uh, infectious diseases. Um, and uh, so this is what they mean. But I think we should expand this very successful model uh, of harm reduction to, uh, to the uh, saving lives uh, in motivating people to switch from combustible cigarette use to less harmful, uh, much less harmful uh, strategies. And that's something um, I have to, I'm working for, I'm struggling for with uh, the means of conferences, with the means of publications, books, um, peer-reviewed uh, journals, articles, and so on. This is something uh, which is, I think, um, fruitful in order, uh, let's say, to uh, persuade, to convince politicians to, um, that uh, it is not a question of either or. It's, that would be wishful thinking. And the whole uh, tobacco control policy was dominated for a decade of, of these wishful thinking um, um, concept. No, no, we have to, to, we have to be more pragmatic, more realistic, uh, more, let's say, target group specific in our messages, in all what we are doing. We cannot have, let's say, this one size fits all strategy. And so far, uh, my attempt is, let's say, to persuade politicians, uh, drug commissioner, health politicians, uh, but also the spokesmen and women of the political parties, uh, to get, uh, let's say, into the whole debate on harm reduction and uh, reset the concept, the frame of reset is an ideal uh, frame for getting into discussions with them. Professor Stirb on that, I'd love Derek to, to chime in if he wishes, uh, but it seems that a major stumbling block within the tobacco control and tobacco harm reduction communities especially in tobacco control, is the overemphasis on the precautionary principle and prevention of youth initiation of tobacco nicotine products, but at the expense of the 1.1 billion adult smokers. It's almost as if the adult smokers and their voices are completely being ignored. It strikes me that your recept principle puts that into a better perspective where youth prevention is absolutely a part of the tobacco control, the tobacco harm reduction, but that there's a clear intent on reaching out to help the adult smoke, which Derek also said was the whole intent of World No Tobacco Day, is to help adult smokers and, and, and connect with them. Am I correct in this, uh, Derek, and, and I know? Well, may, maybe, Heino, if I can uh, comment and put on my epidemiological hat again. Um, um, I think that aside from the, you know, they're the general concerns about kids taking it up and I'm not gonna go into it. I think they are severely overblown in so many ways because there's an assumption that nicotine is going to fry the brains of young people, which it's not. What's well, gonna have these terrible effects on 
gateway leading to smoking and maybe other drugs, which it doesn't. But aside from that, there's a more fundamental reason why um, the, uh, we, we really need to focus with greater vigor on the adult smoker, particularly the adult smoker, I would say almost over the age of 35 or even 40. And the reason is that if we are truly interested in lowering the death and disease rates, which is ultimately what tobacco control is about, the fastest way to do it is to focus on the adult smoker with an established smoking behavior. If you address their needs, you will show within 15 years, which still seems long, but it's pretty short in epidemiological terms, the start of a decline in cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, and a range of other associated conditions linked to smoking. Um, which means that the benefit to the individual will accrue relatively quickly. Um, it'll accrue to the, the government in terms of their healthcare costs, which are becoming substantial with an aging population. And it'll accrue to the society because when people give up a product and move to something else, they open their minds to other healthier activities. Compare that to what happens if not a single kid starts smoking or vaping today, not one. It'll be 50 years plus before we start seeing any benefits in terms of serious health, mortality, and healthcare costs. So I've really not understood why it is that we've opted to not take on the needs that are facing us over the next 15 years and opt to rather do what may be in the best interest of society 50 plus years from now and ignore the parents of the kids who may or may not be about to smoke or vape today. Okay, many thanks, uh, Derek. And continuing uh, what you said, um, I have to say I'm a little bit irritated as well because uh, smoking is the biggest avoidable health risk for Germans. Uh, uh, annually, some 127,000 people die uh, prematurely from tobacco-related uh, health problems. We spend over 100 billion uh, euros every year um, for the consequences of smoking. Um, another uh, very important date is uh, 450,000 people are treated inpatient every year. And uh, this is, these are tremendous costs. These are tremendous uh, health uh, damages um, uh, we are uh, facing every year. And so far, I'm a little bit irritated that not more is invested and done in order to get these figures down. Actually, uh, we have a um, smoker rate, a prevalence rate from 31% in the adult population. This is a high consumption country uh, with uh, not even having a uh, public advertisement ban on smoking products uh, until 2024, then it will come into force completely. So these are all, let's say, facts that uh, should irritate us uh, why governments are not spending more attention, paying not, not more attention and spending not more, let's say, funding into ways of how people can s switch, can quit also from vaping. So this is uh, a miracle for me, to be honest. Another last date is that uh, in the age group from the 12, from 12 to 17, only 6% do say, yes, I smoked in, in the last week. And this is a decrease, which is historical, uh, I have to say. In the uh, 2000, 2000 years, we had a smoking prevalence of uh, um, 20, 25 percent in that age group. So this is going down, fortunately. Um, while we are discussing, let's say, the health risks of combustible cigarettes, it's completely out. It's a, it's a no-go. You are supposed to be a loser once you smoke in this age group. And we should, should look deeper into it, what we can learn from how the youth is perceiving health risks in order, let's say, to uh, extrapolate it to the adult population. Uh, and then we should be aware that uh, yeah, we should go a little bit deeper in the individual's uh, strategies of how to quit smoking, either using uh, electronic nicotine delivery uh, um, systems or, let's say, switch completely into abstinence. 
Um, but we know too few about these individual successful strategies and so far my plea to go deeper into it and let's say um, to have a sort of a political resolution uh, which can be uh, uh, beneficial for these efforts. I know just in terms uh, of the last point on uh, adult smokers being largely ignored in the real world politics of tobacco control. I can also perhaps just add as a physician that the, uh, for a physician, individual health really matters. And at the public health level, there's always a tension between the individual health and the population health interests. And that often, and I, I think that's probably part of the reason why health professionals, doctors, nurses, dentists are largely absent in this debate because they just get on with the work of looking after individual patients. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's a complete loss of an opportunity, which is leading to widespread confusion in terms of the perceptions of nicotine, the perceptions of what really kills and what doesn't. And it is unnecessary. So hopefully uh, the concept of reset will help refocus and help bring more balance in the individual versus population health interests. Just, just a, a further question, having been a witness to both of your bodies of work in your careers, uh, before Jessica talks about the, the manifesto. So I've been witness to the work of uh, Derek Yach um, at WHO, before that at the Medical Research Council in South Africa, and then in various positions in foundations and also the private sector. Uh, and I've also been a witness to your work, I know, in Germany. And I'd say one of the admirable talents that you both have is you have the ability to convene and facilitate multi-stakeholder di dialogue and action. And if you look at the United States, uh, United Nations uh, position statement on the prevention and control of non-communicable disease, it calls for a whole of society and a whole of government approach. And in your careers, you've, you've been able to do that. So I'd like to ask both of you, how can engagement and multi-stakeholder dialogue be facilitated in our current atmosphere in public health and global public health? Yeah, what we are facing um, very often, uh, let's say, in controversial um, issues and controversial discussions is that everybody, each of everybody stays in his or her bubble. So uh, let's say, um, and um, trying, let's say, to, um, yeah, no, no longer to speak with each other. And um, I see it as my task as a university professor to bring uh, multi-stakeholder uh, or to bring stakeholders together on, on the same table in conferences, that they can talk to each other, exchange uh, their arguments and their views. I think this is of utmost importance once you want to get things changed. Um, otherwise, let's say the bubble strategy does not lead, let's say, to the, to the goals we are uh, trying to achieve. So only a common uh, start, a common uh, way of uh, tackling the problem, um, having a common goal. And I'm sure we do have the common goal. It has been mentioned several times throughout this uh, webinar that we are trying to reduce the number of uh, uh, tobacco-related deaths, premature deaths, and that we uh, are trying to reduce uh, the health uh, damages uh, that are uh, leading to these deaths. And uh, I think this consensus is um, easy to uh, let's say um, to 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 uh, to work with and uh, to to, uh, to to base on, um, and uh, this should give us the chance to bring people together. I do conferences, we do uh, position papers, uh, manifestos. We're doing, let's say, um, lots of workshops, webinars, and all these things is the attempt uh, of a, uh, you know, to bring stakeholders uh, in one room in one seminar at the same table. And uh, this is promising for, let's say, persuading people, convincing people of uh, less harmful products, less harmful strategies. Thank you, Aina. Derek, yeah. how can we accelerate engagement? 
Well, I think it's interesting, you know, we're talking about whole of society approaches exactly when the World Bank um, is um, working on a report uh, explicitly to look at whole of society approaches to address non-communicable diseases. And they have recognized that unless we go down that route, um, we're not going to tackle the fact that there are multiple players with multiple perspectives who all need to be at the table. And so I, 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 I completely agree on the, the importance of it. I would add a little twist and to say that um, I think there's one group who absolutely have to be in the leadership and those are uh, people in the health professionals and particularly those sitting on the epidemiology and the science. And secondly, there has to be an early start point to agreeing on what is the base science and knowledge that we have. And for that, I think we don't have to go too far much further than look at the UK government, the NHS, uh, the New Zealand government, and of course, the FDA decisions on what constitutes something that is appropriate for the protection of public health. The label they're now giving to a product that comes from a snus category, an e-cigarette category, and a heated tobacco category. If the, that regulatory body and a number of governments have already thought about this, we don't have to continue the thinking about what truly makes sense from a scientific point of view. The convening is actually to counter the misperceptions and to show the benefits to the different sectors around the table who need to be there. And uh, in general terms, I certainly think that the large employers, uh, the major insurers, um, and in fact, the government funders of all the groups, they really need to be at the table early because it's in their material interest to actually ensure that we reduce the death and disease and the consequent costs and economic impacts of it. Thank you very much, Derek. So now we get to the last part and just the, the next steps of establishing reset. Uh, Jessica, you wanted to just mention manif the manifesto, the plan manifesto. Yes, just a question about the reset manifesto. So what is the intent of the document and where will it be available? So the manifesto will be available from today on, on our website, uh, frankfurt-university.de slash ISFF. Um, the manifesto is the attempt, let's say, to get all these arguments we exchanged today in this webinar together and uh, to use it as a platform. It can be signed. Um, you can support uh, this manifesto by sending in your agreement with that. Uh, we will note your name if you want to, to be noted. And um, this is something, let's say, which uh, should be uh, yeah, utilized in, a, in all public discussions uh, around, let's say, um, the topics we talked about within reset, uh, we just mentioned in the beginning. So uh, maybe could you dis display the slide with the manifesto? Yes, I'll, I'll get to that. I just want to uh, make sure the what we'll do uh, just for the viewers is we'll make sure that the website of the uh, the website of the Frankfurt University is 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 on the tobaccoarmreduction.net and your own. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to quickly get to the position statement and show our viewers what we had in mind. Mm -hmm. So this is the position statement. I'll just quickly scroll down. There's this a bit of background and then it's a short summary of what each of the acronym letters mean. The R for risk proportionate regulation, the E for the ensuring the intended use of um, the tobacco arm reduction products, the S for safety, the E for the environmental considerations and then the traceabilities. And that will then lead to where a stakeholder, whether it's a health professional, whether it's a consumer, uh, whether it's any stakeholder involved in tobacco arm research would have the ability to provide some comments and then add their signature, signature to this manifesto. And the reason for that, if I understood correctly, uh, I know is over the next six months, the EU for one will be calling for specific evidence and then eventually a public consultation on the tobacco product directives. Countries like Germany is an ongoing evaluation of the regulatory framework for tobacco control and arm reduction, as is many other countries. And all of them need this kind of focused attention on what 
the preferred principle should be of uh, an acceleration of uh, harm reduction in their tobacco control. Uh, just as an aside, over the weekend, I was involved in a conference in Bangladesh, a country of 160 million people, uh, where there's a smoking prevalence of 34.7%, a very high prevalence. And if you speak to government officials, it's very difficult for them beyond the framework convention on tobacco control uh, to come to a regulatory framework that makes sense, is risk proportionate and pragmatic for harm reduction. So we applaud the work that you and your unit are doing, I know, and we'll make sure that um, it is communicated as widely as possible from uh, as an independent uh, external source. Mm -hmm. So just on that note, I think we've, we've covered a great deal of territory. We've looked at the complementarity of tobacco harm reduction to tobacco control. We've looked at the reset as a potential accelerator of tobacco harm reduction uh, regulation. And we've uh, been uh, the beneficiaries of the deep experience of both Professor Sturver and Dr. Yach. We want to thank you very much for your input. Any final words from, from both of you, please? My final word would start with my first ones. Today is World No Tobacco Day. Uh, I would urge families, communities, health professionals to reach out to smokers you know and encourage them to do what can be done from a science-based point of view to make this the last day they use a combustible cigarette. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, <clears throat> Dilan uh, uh, and uh, Derek and Jessica. I also would like to stress the importance of this day, but uh, we should interpret, we should develop this day um, to let people know what is uh, what are harm reduction strategies in the field of combustible cigarette use. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, we exchanged a lot of arguments uh, in the today's talk on this webinar, and the manifesto is, is fixing that, uh, let's say, in a written form. Um, let's make the 31st of May to a starting point of a new era where, let's say, harm reduction uh, strategies will be applied and will get into the heads of those stakeholders who are regulating, let's say, um, tobacco and uh, controlling tobacco. And this is something uh, we should stress very much. And I'm very hopeful that uh, this will be the case within the next years, at least. Well, those are two powerful calls to action. We'd like to thank you both most sincerely for your work and for this particular initiative. Thank you, Jessica, as a co-moderator. And just uh, to make sure that uh, our, our viewers uh, can find the resources, we will be uh, publishing a redacted version of this webinar on YouTube and also on LinkedIn. And uh, there you'll see several posts that link to this uh, webinar on social media, particularly LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you very much indeed for your time and energy and your leadership in tobacco control and tobacco arm reduction. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.